Good afternoon and uh, good morning to our colleagues uh, from uh, the international community as well as uh, the African audiences. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Mkandawire. I'm the Africa Director for the Alliance for African uh, Partnership. Would like to uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, dialogue on uh, African Futures Research Leadership Program. And before I proceed uh, with my role as a moderator, uh, I, I would like to uh, call upon the, uh, dean, the, the, the Associate Dean uh, for Academic Programs in the Office of uh, International Studies Program at Michigan State University to make um, a few remarks um, for in, in the opening. So let me call upon uh, Professor Rob Glue to make uh, his uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, let me start by saying good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, as Richard said, I'm Rob Glue, the Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the Office of International Studies and Programs here at MSU, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's workshop, workshop on African Futures Research Leadership Program, Sharing Research Experiences and Findings. I think as many of you know, the Alliance for African Partnership established the African Futures Research Leadership Program in the fall of 2019 with its inaugural cohort. The competitive program targets early career women researchers from the eight AAP member institutions to be jointly supervised by faculty members from MSU and their home institution in research for impact, writing of scholarly and or policy publications, dissemination of research results, and development of grant proposals. The researchers participate in a structured academic advancement program while building bridges and lasting connections with MSU. Scholars were also uh, to participate in a research leadership workshop at the University of Pretoria in September at the end of their one year program. However, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, this program could not take place. The main objective of the African Futures Research Leadership Program is to train a cadre of African researchers so they return to their home institutions and become scientific leaders in their community, help solve Africa's challenges, and in turn become trainers and educators of the next generation. The focus was on women researchers in different regions of the world. I'm sorry, the focus was on women researchers to address the disparity and global concern about the number of women researchers in different regions of the world, in particular in Africa, where on average only 30% of the researchers are women. MSU was pleased to support the next generation of African women scholars through the AAP program. Going forward, we envision that the home institutions of the scholars will commit to providing a conducive research environment and dedicated research time for these early career scholars upon their return home. Our expectation at MSU is that you will all become part of the broader African scholarly network that will continue to build bridges connecting your home institution with MSU and the world. You are now our ambassadors for the Futures Program as the first cohort, and I know that you'll continue to gauge, engage with AAP. We hope that you found the experience productive and that you'll continue to nurture the collaborations and relationships that you've built uh, with our community over the past 12 months, and we have very high expectations for your academic successes. Finally, please know and let me remind you that we now think of you as members of Spartan Nation. You're a member of a community of over 500,000 alumni living around the world. And I trust that whenever you hear someone shout, go green, you will not hesitate and respond, go white. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, um... Uh, Rob, I mean, th this is a, 
you know, a very exciting program. I um, mean, I've had the, the opportunity of uh, crisscrossing across the, the continent and hearing African leaders uh, speak to the need for uh, getting a, a new generation of uh, scientists. Uh, and yet, you know, when you look on the ground, you find that uh, the reality is that uh, we still have a, a dearth of, uh, you know, scientists, of uh, researchers uh, of all manner. Uh, and I think this program is an excellent beginning of, uh, you know, nurturing the next generation of uh, particular female uh, scientists, because uh, uh, as I pointed out, I think we see glaring gender inequalities uh, in uh, our academia, especially. Um, you know, if you look at the leadership positions across Africa in uh, academia, uh, there are not many women in the leadership positions, and neither do, do we have uh, the critical mass of uh, female scientists, or, or indeed, I mean, even uh, researchers more broadly, uh, they're hardly there. Uh, so again, would like to say, you know, thank you very much to Michigan State University uh, for leading uh, in nurturing the next generation of, uh, uh, you know, researchers who will be a model uh, for, uh, you know, other aspiring researchers and hopefully they can join the ranks of, uh, you know, a new generation of uh, researchers. And so we're very excited that uh, this program has uh, taken off and we believe that uh, it will be a model uh, across Africa and uh, donors are listening and uh, African uh, leaders who might be participating uh, here listening, and also uh, leaders of uh, academic institutions are listening. Uh, I, I think uh, the challenge is actually on all of us to generate uh, this new pool of our uh, scientists, uh, particular female scientists and uh, other researchers uh, to, to really build, build a critical mass of uh, researchers across uh, uh, the, 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 the continent. Um, uh, allow me uh, at this juncture to uh, briefly indicate that uh, we have uh, two segments uh, of, um, you know, this um, uh, dialogue. Uh, the, 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 the first segment um, will actually, uh, you know, uh, commence very shortly. Um, we have, um, you know, a total of nine panelists and each of the panelists will be given uh, 10 minutes of our presentation. And, um, you know, focusing on each of the, 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 the thematic areas. And then from there, we'll proceed to question and answer. And um, the, 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 the uh, first uh, uh, session uh, is actually looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the subject of education and uh, sports and uh, environment, uh, a broad range of uh, disciplines. Um, and um, allow me, uh, just to very quickly introduce uh, these uh, panelists. And uh, first, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Wellor Tambora, who is assistant professor at, Uni at University of Letters and Human Sciences, Bamako, Mali. Her uh, specialization is on uh, information uh, communication theories, organization communication, uh, and writing for di digital media. Uh, her related work is on uh, peace building in Mali. And also, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Linda Chukura, who is assistant professor in the Department of Human Kinetics, Health Education at University of Nigeria in Suka. She's currently a postdoctoral uh, fellow with uh, the Institute for Study of Youth and Sports at uh, Michigan State University. Um, her specialization include uh, sports administration and her core areas of research also include research in uh, gender equality, youth athletics development, risk management in sports, among others. Uh, let me further introduce uh, Dr. Helen Agu uh, from Un Un University of Nigeria uh, at Insuka. Uh, she is a lawyer, but also lecturer in the Department of uh, International and Comparative Law. She's also uh, a, a research fellow of uh, Raul Weinberg Institute for Human and Humanitarian Law. Her current research explores gender dimensions of women in wildlife trafficking in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, let us proceed uh, with uh, the first uh, uh, presentation from uh, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Willori Tambura, the Assistant Professor, University of Letters and Human Sciences, Bamako, Mali. Uh, Willor? Yes. Um, please come through. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon in some part of the world. Um, My country, Mali, is famous for its culture and uh, its uh, great history. But these last 10 years, a multidimensional crisis has slowed down its development. Uh, since 2013, peace peacekeeping operations have been underway on Malian territory without, however, succeeding in putting uh, an end to the crisis. At the same time as these uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, other action are being under, undertaken for a sustainable peace in Mali. Our work, thanks to the support of AAP funds, is part of the peace building and national reconciliation of Mali through the partnership between uh, the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities um, which I will refer to during my presentation as ARCA, the scientific animation without borders as SOBO, and the Malian Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Com Commission as SEVEGIER. I will start by a brief um, overview uh, of my activities uh, as a visiting scholar are Ar at ARCA. And then I will uh, talk uh, more specifically about one of our ongoing projects on peace building in Mali. And then finally, I will outline the main challenges uh, and the ex expected impact of our work in Mali. <clears throat> Um, in order to prompt a social and uh, institutional transformation in Mali uh, at the end of this uh, AAP program, uh, my work at ARCA has been very diverse uh, with both research activities, teaching activities, community engagement, uh, curriculum development, uh, and fundraising. Among these activities, uh, we have uh, developed uh, various projects, including uh, the one in peace building uh, and reconciliation through the partnership uh, between uh, ARCA, SOBO, and SEVEGIER. The partnership uh, between uh, ARCA and Mali is a long standing one. Um, it began in the early year 2000 uh, with a community school project in Kati, a small town uh, near Bamako, the capital city of Mali. And uh, Sobo uh, joined uh, the work in 2017 uh, with um, the adaptation of uh, a picture book, Ben Sigili, which means uh, building peace in Bamanankan, one of the uh, most popular language in Mali into video animation. And uh, the Malian Truth Justice and Reconciliation uh, Commission um, was very interested uh, in this video animation about building peace. And uh, this led the president of the commission, Mr. Sidibe, uh, to request uh, the collaboration uh, of ARCA and SOBO to achieve uh, the Sevegier goal uh, of uh, national reconciliation in Mali. Sorry. Uh, the scientific animation uh, without borders uh, is a MSU based uh, program uh, which transforms extension information on uh, relevant topics such as uh, uh, agriculture, women empowerment, disease, etc., into animation which are 
uh, then voiced overlaid into a diversity of language from around the world. And the partnership agreement between uh, the Malian Truth Justice and the Reconciliation Commission, ARCA and SOBO, uh, was signed at the end of uh, 2019. The main goal uh, of uh, this project is to realize the promise of uh, CVGR to forge a new national contract, uh, social contract in Mali based upon trust and non-violent conflict resolution uh, by analyzing and synthesizing the information from the 16,000 uh, CVGR victim testimony by creating a unified story through a series of uh, video animation, and then by disseminating the video through Sobo uh, to pave the way for social dialogue in order to uh, achieve national reconciliation in Mali. To achieve these goals, we analyzed videos, um, testimonies, and uh, interview from CVGR. We also wrote scenarios on specific topics from CVGR, uh, from CVGR records. Uh, we have four scenarios ready on uh, different topics, such as abandonment, forgiveness, reparation, and social and institutional uh, issues. We also produced a promotional video, uh, which will uh, permit us to raise funds. And uh, we are now uh, uh, working on the creation of video animation uh, on the different scenarios I just mentioned uh, in collaboration with uh, my home institution, the University of Letter and Human Science of Bamako and, uh, Malian, and Malian artists. <clears throat> So the main challenge for us is that um, the re realization of our project uh, and the achievement of our goals depend on the funds. The production, uh, the production of a video animation is very expensive. So we have been able to achieve many steps in uh, the project thanks to the support of uh, AAP funds. And of course, uh, our common enemy, COVID-19, made us revise our plan and uh, sometimes renounce to certain steps or at least um, adapt them in order to be able uh, to move forward. In terms of impact, this project will permit uh, to provide a better understanding of the multidimensional conflict in Mali, uh, to reach a maximum of people through the use of Sobo uh, technology, uh, to initiate dialogue through storytelling, um, to make uh, Malian University an engine of social and uh, institutional change. And uh, in uh, a long term, in a longer uh, term, uh, we would like to include peace education in the national curriculum in Mali. And uh, we have already started to work uh, through AAP Transforming Institution Fund, a community engagement project in higher education in West Africa uh, 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 with uh, MSU. Uh, the College of Worcester, my home institution, uh, institution ULSHB, the University, uh, Sheikh Anta Job University of uh, Dakar in Senegal, and the University of uh, Gambia. And uh, peace education is uh, including uh, in this, uh, uh, will be including in this curriculum. And finally, to pave the way to peace and reconciliation through dialogue in Mali. Now I would like to take one minute to say thank you to MSU, AAP, ARPA for this program, uh, the training, the research activities, etc. 
also, I would also like to thank my home institution, the University of Letter and Human Science of Bamako and my department, the University Institute of Technology for their support. And uh, a, a special thanks to my mentors, the Dean Stephen Eski from ARTA and the former rector of my, my university in Mali, the Professor Mati Samake. Also say thanks to you to many people, organization, association I met here, a wonderful people from RDC, the Refugee Development Center, the Great Lansing United Nations Association, the French Alliance, our Malian partners, CVGR, the International Sport Alliance, and Right to Play. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Werori. Uh, thank you. Peace education and uh, the nurturing of uh, young people into peace building and uh, looking at also the uh, development of a curriculum in universities, absolutely uh, critical uh, for Africa, uh, particularly in uh, conflict prone countries. Uh, I believe we will have questions later on, um, but uh, you know, I think for uh, the brevity of time, um, I think uh, we can proceed uh, to get another presentation uh, from our colleagues uh, who are working in uh, the area of uh, youth and uh, sports, um, uh, and uh, also, you know, health-related uh, um, areas. So let me call upon uh, Dr. Linda Chuku Chukura. Um, to give her a, a brief, and then uh, after that, we'll call upon the next person, and then uh, we'll go into, into questions. Uh, Linda? All right, um, good day, everybody. Um, mine is an empirical work titled Gender Inequity in Media Coverage and Atlas Warfare in Nigerian Sports, Impact of National Sports Policy and African Union Agenda 263. Sports is a great equalizer lies on the principle of all having equal opportunity to participate in sports activities, irrespective of the gender, color, or race. However, it has been observed that there's low or poor percentage of women participation in sports. It was until Vancouver and London Olympics 2010 and 2012 that women attained 40% participation record and is projected to get up to 49% in the next Olympic Games. This is as a result of unrelentless feminist movement and change in legislations such as gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming is a United Nations policy that took effect in 1997, and this policy aims at minimizing all forms of gender discrimination or inequality across all nations and all sectors, including sports. Bringing it down to Nigeria is the National Sports Policy of Nigeria 2009. This is a guiding document of, for sports administration and sports participation at all levels in Nigeria. Embedded in this policy are philosophies and values which this policy seeks to promote. And one of the, one of the values is equality. Then the question that arises is this, is equality as embedded in the, agenda, in the policy a reality in Nigerian sports? There have been series of claims by female sports teams in Nigeria of not being treated equally as their male counterparts. And that this is not in line with the African Union Agenda 263. African Union Agenda 263 took effect in 2015, and this came up as a result and the need to refocus Africa as a continent of unity, economic development, freedom, and equality. To achieve this broad agenda, seven aspirations were mapped out. And the sixth aspiration borders on Africa, whose development is people-driven, relying on the potentials of its women. This aspiration shows that the African women, that African women possess the capabilities and the potentials to take Africa as a continent to the next level. Then the question that comes up again is, has this whole agenda achieved gender equality 
in Nigeria sports. Therefore, this study was out to ascertain inequalities that exist in national sports in Nigeria, having the females in focus, factors associated with these gender inequalities, consequences of gender inequality to Nigerian sports, and achievement of gender equity in sports by Nigerian Sports Policy and African Union Agenda 263. It was a descriptive survey study and uh, focused on uh, national sports teams, senior national sports teams of soccer, field and track athletics. The major criteria that was used to select these respondents was that each respondent must have represented Nigeria in not less than two international competitions. Data was collected via interview and results were presented in themes. Now the results. On welfare package, a huge gap was found between the welfare package of male and female teams, irrespective of the fact that both duration and demands of sports are the same. For example, the female soccer players are being given 400 to 500 US dollars as much allowance, whereas their male counterparts get as much as 4,000 to 5,000 US dollars for the same level of competition. More so, it was found that the female teams engage in a lot of sit in hotel strike actions before they even get paid, even when the money has been released, which is not conversant or does it occur so much with the male teams? The study also revealed that female teams have benefited nothing from win for winning trophies and medals for Nigeria, while their male counterparts have gotten good car gifts, cash gifts, land gifts from the same government. Then on media, it was actually discovered that female sports enjoy higher media coverage than the female. Both print and electronic media give male sports, male competitions very high hype than the female, thus relegating really female games to the background. The only, on the, the only underlying factor associated with this inequality, as was found from the study, is this belief and perception that male teams are more superior than the female teams, irrespective of the fact that in Nigeria, male teams, male national teams, has brought a lot more, a lot more medals, a lot more trophies than the, female, than the male teams. It's good to note that the super falcons of Nigeria, they are the current champions in Africa and they've been champions for nine to 10, 11 times, but then they have nothing to show for it. Even the, the, the coaches of female teams are not exempted from this treatment as was found in the study. This unending gender bias has led to a lot of talented female athletes quitting sports whole and entire, while some has gone to nationalize in other countries and keep representing them at the highest level, including the very current Women World 400 meters champion, she is a Nigerian, but she has gone to represent other countries. She has gone to nationalize in another country. Now, the, the study re revealed that both Nigerian sports policy, African Union Agenda 2063 policy, they have not achieved much in removing all form of gender inequity in Nigerian sports. What does this findings imply? It goes a, lot, a high degree to imply that the attainment of the sixth agenda of 2000 and African Union agenda of 2063 will be a, a complete mirage if urgent practical actions are not taken to eliminate or minimize to a very great extent all forms of gender inequality in Nigerian sports teams. This is very, very important because Nigeria is one of the countries we looked upon in Africa to spearhead the achievement of this beautiful Agenda 263. Among other recommendations, it's very important that as a, as a matter of urgency, gender equity education should be introduced in all sports associations in Nigeria, across all levels, local, local level, state level, and federal level. 
then without much time, I want to acknowledge in no uh, particular order, there's a uh, program directors, Jose Malete, Ami Jemison, and the supporting staff, Lisa Hines, Lisa Fuji, and of course, Justine. I also want to acknowledge the chair, the chairman of uh, kinesiology department, I miss you here, Al Smith, the director of Institute for the Study of Youth Sports, Dan Gold, my mentor, Lefs Malite, and uh, my research group um, members, Doreen, Cece, and David. My home institution will not be forgotten, of course. The past dean, faculty of education, Professor Dom Ngoke, then the current dean, Professor Joshua Emeka Omifekwem, the current head of the department, Professor JC Nji, and of course, the AAP focal person in UNN, Professor Ifi Achike, and most definitely my mentor, Professor Elsie Chuzwa Umano. I will not also leave out my family, who have been a great support to me in my studies and my career. And of course, my friends have always been there. NK Arizo, I thank you all. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Th thank you very much indeed, Linda. Thank you very much uh, uh, you, on your work on uh, gender inequalities in national sports. Uh, and uh, this uh, does not only relate to Nigeria, uh, I think it has implications uh, across uh, uh, Africa. Uh, I, I think you are ch challenging, especially our governments in Africa, that they need to address these challenges around gender inequalities. And I believe there will be quite a few questions arising uh, from uh, you know, this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, let me uh, go uh, to the uh, last but not least uh, of uh, this particular segment to give a presentation is uh, Dr. Heleni Agu, uh, who has done a lot of work on uh, you know, issues around uh, gender, the dimensions uh, uh, of uh, women in wildlife trafficking. Um, a, a very important uh, you know, topic which uh, cuts across um, African uh, countries where there's a lot of trafficking uh, taking place, particularly uh, in the context of wildlife. So Helen, uh, please over to you. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for being here. The topic of our research is on women in wildlife trafficking, which broadly we are exploring the gender dimensions in Sub-Saharan Africa. I was working directly under the mentorship of Dr. Gore and his mentor, Professor Joy Ezilo. Wildlife trafficking, which is the unlawful harvest and illegal trade in white flora and fauna and their paths and derivatives, has been one of the transnational crimes in recent times that some estimate is worth more than uh, about five to 23 billion US dollars. We know that wildlife trafficking impacts not only the environment by causing the extinction of uh, white flora and fauna, but also affects states in realizing their sustainable development goals because it causes undercutting of sustainable investments. And sub Saharan Africa happens to be home to many high profile species and also some of the protected areas, as well as people that are overly impacted by the issue of wildlife trafficking. And uh, we find out that current research and funding have been directed on other issues considering, uh, concerning wildlife trafficking, such as um, studying the demands and the uh, attitude towards intervention, human wildlife conflict. But it appears that gender issues appears to be underplayed. Despite since 2006, there have been some evidence that uh, actors in wildlife trafficking are highly gendered uh, in, their, um, in their approaches. So this part are interesting because we feel, uh, we assume that since there is a, women constitute more than half of the population and there is a UN 2019 snapshot on gender and policy focused on women and we are asking whether women are we tackling the issue of uh, wildlife trafficking with our hands tied at the back. So we set out to explore the roles, the experiences and participation of women in wildlife trafficking. We did not intend to demonize women 
But what we intend to do is how has this impacted women? What are their experiences? Can we really achieve the issue of wildlife trafficking control without taking into consideration the uh, its effects and the participation and the contributions of women? To do this, we uh, drawing on the uh, feminist uh, uh, ecology and green criminology, we drew up a novel conceptual framework made up of uh, six primary roles and about 31 secondary roles, which we used to characterize the roles that women may play in wildlife trafficking, as well as profiling trends and gaps in uh, knowledge. So this includes offender role, which are those people that are actually committing the offense, causing harm by poaching and by selling or even enabling those that are doing the illegal art. Then we talked about the defender role, which are the people that are involved in a authority, either formal or informal, like we have some all-female uh, team in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. And then we also looked at how are women involved in formal law enforcement, like the military and the police. And then we also looked at the role of influencer, how are women connected directly or indirectly to the issue of wildlife trafficking by influencing the trade or influencing uh, positive actions to control these uh, actions. Then how are women ob uh, observers, like such as scientists and journalists, those that are actually keeping watch on what is happening and women have been, uh, been very active in this role. Then we looked at are women part of the person's harm by the issue of wildlife trafficking, like, uh, can they become widows as a result of poachers dying or do they lose their sons or lose their children or their partners or their relations? Then we also said, are women benefiting from this uh, illegal trade? Uh, they, are they employed? Do they enter into wildlife trafficking in order to meet up, in order to become uh, empowered? In order to do this, uh, we approach this work in three segments. First, in order to establish the gap in knowledge, we went into literature review. And uh, through the help of uh, African Studies Center at the Michigan State Library, we were able to use the volume protocol and we were able to identify about 41 pieces of literature published between 2010 and 2019. And we analyzed this and we were able to, uh, along the conceptual framework already developed, to find and uh, we're able to establish the gap in knowledge which we published in global ecology and the conservation. Then the second aspect, we use the quantitative online survey which we put out between the uh, weeks of February 4 to 21. And uh, surprisingly, we had more than 200, about 250 reports. And uh, these are across many countries which we use to, just not in Africa, but to see whether this is only peculiar to Africa alone, or does it also apply to others? And we find that, that there are variabilities of roles that women may play in wildlife trafficking. Then the third stage, we use key informant interviews. I was in Ethiopia in November, and we, we had a, uh, some uh, key participants, so specialists in the area of wildlife trafficking, because you know that this is not where you can come in and you see the traffickers uh, already there. So we were able to connect with many other persons and we were able to interview about 35 experts across Africa, working across South Saharan Africa, working in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and uh, other places in Africa. What were our results? The literature synthesis actually revealed that uh, the issue of wildlife trafficking appears gender blind. Almost half of the articles discussed the issue of wildlife trafficking very minimally, and only three of and actually dwelled on uh, two areas, offender and transitor rules. The apparent lack of uh, uh, depth in these uh, discussions showed that uh, the issue of women is treated with, uh, you know, as if it does not really offend, which we know by collaboration, by key, interview, key format interviews, we're able to establish that this actually the, uh, the norms that people believe that women are not really there. But they are there. Then the quantitative online survey also revealed that uh, the role for women are actually least important and least prevalent. But uh, the most important happens to be the defender role that women actually are more uh, susceptible to 
because of that and nature of conservation that they are more involved in it. But we find that women are less represented in defender role, though that they, the quantity survey says that they are more important. So we find women involved as consumers and also least involved as beneficiaries. And there is a diversity in variation of the respondents between observer and asbestos hand. Surprisingly, we find that the corruptor uh, role loaded quite high for women because they say that women are not uh, actually actually less comfortable than men when it comes to uh, the defender role. So women also happen to be vocal as postperson working in different areas. So in the third stage, the study also revealed that the defender role appears very much underrepresented. Why the offender rules, women are seen as uh, collectors, traders, and consumers of wildlife. And uh, but even at that, that, they benefit in this by their local trade at the source level in most sub Saharan African countries. We find that they bear such harm that it has created many widows and emergency health, health of household. So, what have been the conclusions? We, we say that uh, though that. Uh, uh, men and women feature in wildlife trafficking across sub-Saharan Africa, but men predict the trade. But women were also found out to be to feature among the six primary rules that we use as a benchmark for the study. But uh, the offender and the defender and the driver rules were more prominent. But there are associated costs and benefits associated with such participation. Then we are asking the role of women is important for program success and uh, policy planning, because if we take away the issue of women, we find that, that yes, we will not actually collapse the wildlife trafficking network, but we will significantly reduce uh, the trade. Because women can, if they have alternative sustainable livelihood, they can be turned into become uh, informants and even protesters of the environment. So we say the issue of wildlife trafficking cannot be approached with only one uh, 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 that it requires a, a multi-pronged approach, which involves uh, interdisciplinary studies like we have done. And we are looking forward that uh, this will translate from research to policy. What's having our research impacts from this, we have been able to have at least uh, three publications. One is already published, you can look at it at Global Economy, where we looked at this uh, uh, literature synthesis, where we're able to supply the literature that not now anybody studying in this area will be uh, broken in the data about what the participation of women in wildlife trafficking. Then also in the uh, one else uh, uh, article have been accepted, which we are saying how are women cracking the glass ceilings in conservation. Then we also, in the, from the key format interview, we're also looking at exclusion and inclusion of women in wildlife trafficking. And uh, the biggest takeaway from this is that we have a book project, which Rutledge have already accepted, which we have opened the discussion, which involved people from Latin America, people from Europe, and people from Africa that we met across our interview uh, collection, data collection, and they are contributing chapters in this project, which will be out by early 2021. What are the collaboration? We have been able to establish collaboration with UNODC, Forestry and Wildlife Crime Unit. And uh, we are going to brief them on this because they were interested. I was there in October, and they were very much interested in this. And IUCN World Conservation Conference, we are going to present our work as part of the Social Science Working Group of the Commission on Environment and Economic uh, Commission. Then Women for Africa also is also a collaborator because uh, we have just opened this question. Women have gathered themselves to show that we are not only to be uh, heard, we need to be seen, we need to be heard, we need to make our impact, we need to create it. So we have a collaboration with them. Then how do we translate this work from research to policy? We say we're having policy group with the Department of Rural Agriculture at the African Union Commission. And currently we are working, I'm a champion of UNODC Education for Justice, where we intend to continue discussion by talking and uh, mentoring younger women and talking to them about discouraging wildlife crime. We're going to have a book conference and conference on gender and illegal wildlife trade in order to continue the discussion. I want to say thank you so much for AAP and uh, MSU for providing me the enabling environment in which I worked here and enjoyed myself. Departments of Fishes and Wildlife, they have been there for me, Dr. Scott, Leverett, and all the non-teaching staff. You people have been so good. University of Nigeria, my dear Vice Chancellor, and uh, the focal person, Professor Fiatike, 
for providing us this opportunity and enabling us to be here. I want to thank you and ODC for being willing to continue the discussion, even to carry it beyond African continent into other uh, continents. Then we Africa, Women for Africa, we are, they are also interested in this. I want to say thank you to them. Professor Favre, College of Law, Michigan State University, International Environmental Law class. I had a lecture with them. I had a program with them. And I want to say thank you sir, for being there. MSU Library, on the head of the African Studies Unit and their returns, and Susan Tetimada, guided me through the use of Mendeley. I want to thank every one of you for being there. Dr. Wenda Bospar of Jensen, your class of AMP that helped in the transition of the key informant interviews. I cannot forget your sacrifice and your labor of love. And I want to thank my family for being there for me and for my friends. Thank you very much for listening. I'm so happy to be a, a champion and an ambassador from this program. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, this is uh, wonderful indeed. I mean, and uh, again, a very important, uh, you know, uh, very unique area, which uh, has uh, pan-African uh, dimensions. Uh, but I think more importantly, I think thank you again for reminding us uh, that uh, these scholars who are actually giving these presentations uh, are very high caliber scholars who are already uh, publishing in a referee journals uh, as a result of uh, their uh, attachment, um, you know, to uh, MSU, but beyond that, uh, their own track record back home. Uh, so we, we truly, I, th I think, I appreciate that uh, already you are demonstrating that uh, uh, this, uh, you know, mentoring program has been uh, worth a while. Uh, much, much, much uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, I think at this juncture, we'd like to move on to uh, uh, questions. Uh, we're getting quite a number of uh, questions. Uh, coming from a, a whole range of uh, uh, participants, uh, you know, uh, starting, uh, you know, with Mali, for example, there the are questions around, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't, uh, you know, this peace building effort and uh, where you're including in education start at elementary schools, uh, uh, you know, in, at elementary level, um, you know, so that, uh, you know, children begin to grow in a culture of uh, peace, um, you know, if we can get some reaction to that, um, okay. you know, uh, you know, uh, and um, more broadly, maybe, you know, uh, I, I think um, in sports as well as uh, I think Ellen's work, um, you know, how do we ensure that we eliminate gender bias? Uh, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, whether it's in sports or whether it is in wildlife trafficking, um, how, how do we make sure that uh, we eliminate gender bias? Uh, but I think more critical as well is uh, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, some of these critical issues, particularly, you know, these disparities we're talking about, uh, whether it's in sports or whether it's in wildlife or, or indeed, I mean, uh, even uh, in, uh, you know, education and peace, how do we make sure that uh, there's buy-in from government, that, uh, you know, governments begin to really uh, commit resources to these uh, very important, uh, you know, uh, areas? So um, I, I think for, you know, the sake of time, we'll give you, uh, each one of you, um, maybe, um, you know, two minutes uh, to respond to, uh, you know, some of those questions, uh, starting with, uh, you know, uh, Fatumata. Fatumata. Me? Uh, well, so, right. so, well, all right, well, all right. Yeah, okay, no problem, thank, thank you. Okay. Well, all right, of course, well, all right. Yeah, uh, thank you, Risha. Um, yes, indeed, I think that, you know, peace building is a long-term thing. It's not like uh, in comparison to peacekeeping operation, even if the case of Mali is uh, show that peacekeeping can also be a long-term one, that peace building is a long-term a, a long, uh, uh, thing. So I think that it would be relevant and necessary for, necessary for Mali to find a way to, in, uh, in the curriculum, since uh, the primary school, to think about it and to talk about it. And also, and I think that one of our, the work of ARCA, partnership of ARCA with uh, Mali, uh, I give the example of uh, the Chiwara School and uh, the Popular Education Institute in Kati, the small town near, uh, near Bamako, the capital city. It, it is a small project, but that was the idea. 
that was uh, a community and uh, school community working uh, uh, with a video, for example, our uh, building piece video animation. And please, if you want to see this video, it's available on the website of Sobo web website under the team of uh, Peace and Justice. It's the only uh, video animation uh, on peace building. And then this kind of video could be used, for example, uh, for making uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the students or in primary school thinking about and talking about it. And that's a particularly relevant for Mali or in Africa in general because we grew up with storytelling. So I think things like that could be very relevant uh, yeah, in uh, the education system. And uh, one of the problem in Mali is for a long time we denied the existence of this uh, problem, which began like a, a rebellion problem uh, from the north against the south of the country. So that could maybe uh, help and a, a, a solution, not the only solution, but could be a solution for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, probably, thank would, you, uh, Laurie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, probably I'll just jump in because of uh, time. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, yes, Nigeria is a very large continent and uh, has a lot of uh, sound educated sports administrators. But the truth is this, there is urgent need for sports administrators to stop pay, paying lip service, uprooting equality in the policy from theory to practical. Because these uh, technical know-how and manpower, they are there. These female athletes, they are there. The money is there, but this culture, cultural belief that males are superior than females thereby neglecting the potentials of this female is a major problem. So it's high time that they stop this because they are well-traveled, they are learned, and I believe so much they're in tune with the world situation of um, removing gender inequality. Also, one of the ways this can be tackled at the long term is that physical education is a, a subject being taught at the primary school level. And I know that one of the topics, both from the primary school to the secondary school, has a gender embedded, gender equality embedded in it. So it's high time that sports associations, or rather physical education bodies, association bodies like NAFA SD, Ishpa SD, and all of them should go back to the drawing board and ensure that physical education is not being relegated to the background. And those that, are, those that teach physical education are only qualified persons, because only qualified teachers can go into physical education, teach the course, teach the subject, and also bring out these gender issues. And uh, you know, when you start from the cradle, where you catch them young, these are the ones that will grow to get be administrators. So with that understanding and that mindset at early age, you find out that this cultural belief, this cultural perception of male being more superior will be eliminated, will be eliminated at the long run. Also, we have, sports associations that carry out workshops and training periodically. So it's very important that gender equity education is introduced in these training workshops, thereby gradually changing the mindset of these coaches that will, de will com come tomorrow to be sports administrators against this, um, to train their mind, get their mind off inequality. Most importantly, looking at this broad agenda 263 is very important that yes we have this policy we have this agenda very beautiful but there is need to have indices of evaluation so that at the, at the long run probably periodically african you know will come back to the table and see how, how far have we gone to achieve these aspirations what and what are still remaining how do we go about ensuring that this is achieved so that we have the africa or the continent we look forward to see come 2063, relying on the potentials of its women. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, indeed, yeah. Um, uh, we can move on uh, to, to Ellen. Um, there's oh. a question here. There's a question. Uh, okay. And I, I, I think the, the question is on, uh, you know, how did you implement the online survey? Um, 
you know. Okay. Um, it, it was through the Quartrix uh, technique. We sent it on and uh, we sent it through the web links of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the me and my PI. Then uh, we also put it as a social media handle so that accounts so that uh, and also a professional list at like Society for Conservation Biology and also uh, Nigerian Bar Association Environmental Law Section Group and they, they were, were able to there it was a kind of opportunity opportunist something so that uh, you can feel it and it was something that you can feel and you are able to close and continue. So, but it, it didn't take more than 10 minutes to, uh, to complete the survey. So we put it out during the month of February from 4 to 29, and uh, it uh, went across uh, about uh, beyond Africa. And uh, we also collect, uh, got the results and we analyze it using uh, quantitative uh, techniques. So, if I may respond to the issue of on ground regarding uh, how we are going to correct the gender inequities, uh, especially where it concerns, uh, I said that my own my our own area of study is not different from the general gender inequalities that have been uh, been promoted by the United Nations. And uh, where we were working, we were surprised to find out that the UNODC report of 2016 had three chapters on the uh, use of wildlife product that the demand that are befalling the wildlife trade. And one of them, surprisingly, is on fashion. The other one, chapter five, is on uh, jewelry. Chapter six is on cosmetics and perfume. And these are issues that concern women. And nobody's saying anything about involvement of women. And we also, have on ground the performance of all female in the defending role, the performance of all female uh, units like the Akashinga women in, uh, in Zimbabwe that is made up of all even traumatized women that have been sexually abused and have passed through different trauma, but they have vested their talent and they were using it to fight poaching in uh, Zimbabwe. And also we have the same outfits in Black Mamba uh, in South Africa. That if these new needs have done so well for them, it's a point that, that women can do creditably when it comes to defense. So what we are saying, we are speaking to the policymakers to translate this research into policy. And that's why we are briefing UNODC, and that's why we are briefing the African Union Commission, so that they can talk to African governments in strategizing and in producing programs for the control of wildlife trafficking. We need to be aware of the impact of this on women Especially when we were in King John Farmer's interview, you find out that militarized approach in Kenya, that women were actually excluded from the defense because they were seen as being weak. They cannot carry uh, weapons to fight poachers in the body. You, you don't need muscle to ca carry weapons. So if women should be given opportunity and they can do creditably well, and we need them at the border so that people will not just carry the eggs of ostrich and they'll come and raise their hand and pass through the a metal glass, but if we have women there, they can always touch them. People, women that are trained in wildlife uh, trafficking de uh, detection, they will be able to find that some of these pockets have uh, eggs of ostriches. So it's important that we not only look at Africa happens to be the source level, but we also have the demand level at the Europe and the share. So this work needs to be scaled up so that we see that the impact not only on women and also how women can be involved in conservation. Thank you. No, th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think to save time, I think we'd like to move on to the next uh, set of presentations. But I, I just want to say, you know, thank you very much indeed for these excellent presentations. Uh, I think very clear reflecting uh, the quality of uh, the exposure you've had and uh, I think your, your own leadership positions uh, back, you know, in, in, in your countries. Uh, and more importantly, I think this work which uh, you are undertaking is of a huge relevance to the African Agenda 2063. It is of pan-African nature. Uh, and I think together we may need to begin to explore how we might actually front it uh, to the African Union, to regional economic communities, uh, because the issues of peace building, sports, uh, as well as uh, you know, trafficking, political world trafficking, are very relevant to uh, African uh, development agendas. So would be very keen, I think, as AAP to explore those opportunities of fronting this uh, excellent work uh, among African leaders um, and indeed even the international community. So we appreciate uh, for these excellent uh, presentations. 
uh, I would like us to, to move on to the next set of uh, uh, presentations. Uh, and this is actually uh, looking at the nexus between agri-food systems, uh, food uh, security, nutrition, health, absolutely critical priorities are for Africa. Um, and again, would like to, to, to hear, uh, I think some of the excellent work that uh, is uh, coming from uh, these uh, uh, early career scholars, um, you know, uh, and uh, also to reflect further uh, how we make sure that uh, uh, this work uh, is uh, supported beyond uh, the work they've been uh, doing uh, in their countries and their universities, uh, as well as uh, with uh, their collaborators uh, at Michigan State University. So to start with, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Ruth Amuleni, who is a lecturer at Makerere University, um, to really begin to uh, reflect and share with us our research uh, on, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, insects uh, for food and feed in Africa uh, and other related work, um, you know, of, 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 of interest, I think, to all of us. Uh, so, Helen, uh, Deborah? 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 Yes, I can hear you. I'm ready. Yes, please. I proceed to give uh, us your presentation. You have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the honor for the presentation. Uh, as indicated, I'm going to give a 10 minute presentation here explaining my work at MSU. This work was done with the support from AAP and mentorship from Dr. Professor Eric Bembo, uh, Dr. Jane Bakal from here, and then Professor Michael Ochaido from Makere University, where I come from. Um, my work was the computer is okay. My work was broad, uh, mainly focused on insects. I'm a person who has worked with insects for 12 years but mainly focused on bees. But this time around, I've been expanding now towards uh, other insects like the black soldier fly. Why insects? Uh, of course, we all know that in Africa, we host half of the world's poor. And there are a lot of stunted children, issues of malnutrition. So we need to see how to possibly save the protein for, uh, uh, as much as possible by exploring to insects and either in application for food or animal feed. And also, we also have a big looming population of people who are unemployed, the youth. We also have a lot of waste that is in markets that needs, or in markets or foods that needs to be recycled and can be put into meaningful manure. And then we, we have to now begin focusing on utilizing less water and land requirements and, and thinking of ecological footprint. So in that, it positions insects as a suitable alternative for the rural population. While I was here, we had come to see how we can apply insects for post-waste recycling. So my work at MSU involved a broad activity of lab work and also some field, some surveys, and then also some experiment that was in Uganda. There's a small unit. So one, to, we asked ourselves uh, if it was possible to determine the cost-effective rearing model uh, for the black soldier fly. I will introduce the fly later. Two, we wanted to see if it was possible to improve the productivity of that fly by utilizing different types of waste. And then three, I also participated in a study that was in another lab with Pro Professor Matthew real shop in testing some of the biological applications, how we could use the, the black soldier fly in pest control. And that is still ongoing research, it interfered by COVID and other factors, as well as that. So upon return to Makere, which is happening soon, my focus would be now to see how can we work out a strategy for commercialization 
because building on experience from Africa, from, from the honey value chain, we were able to make now, like in our country, people talk about honey. Every household has honey as a household name, but it's not the case for some of these things like the black soldier fly. So for other people, what's the black soldier fly? The, the, the black soldier fly, it's a very nice organic waste recycling fly, easy to rear. Uh, although in other places people think it's complicated. It, it's an efficient organic recycler. It's uh, non-parasitic in a sense that some other flies, you could utilize them and then they end up living in the environment and causing problems. For it, it lives for only seven to eight days when it's an adult and it dies. So it doesn't have that potential. And it has high value of protein. Actually, in the, in the, in the preceding models that we'll show you, it was able to replace the fish, fish meal, which is a very costly, and we also need to save the fish for the children. So it reproduces in large biomass, like one fly can lay up to 500 eggs in a day, sorry, in a lifetime, 500 to 900, and it's environmentally friendly. So the key objective out of the broad studies, what I will just present here is I'll just share with you uh, the three, the, the, what we did, like the three results, like assessing the willingness, because upon realizing, okay, this nice fly in Uganda, it's not a new thing. I'm not the first, or oh, I'm not, I'm among the first people to start with the black soldier fly. The challenge still remains is why are there a few people who have taken up the, the enterprise? We wanted to find the, the likelihood of factors that influence someone to adopt it and examine the profile of the buyers and then see. A, a technical economic perspective because everybody keeps asking how much do I put in, how much do I get out, what what do I do, like, so in the local context. To do that, we sent out, um, I designed a questionnaire here and sent to the Mercury team uh, that captured views. In Uganda, we have a, what we call a, a farmer's show. It's an annual show that brings farmers from different districts all over the country. It's a very large show, even some foreign visitors. It's called Harvest Money Expo. So in this interview, there were respondents from 21 districts to capture different views, their views on how well they perceived the, the black soldier fly or whatever they knew about it. And then we also, since there wasn't much of, of the adopters, people who have taken it up, we had to do a desktop review to pick out certain information in terms of the new trends and trying to see how we could model. But then lastly, also we had, I had a small unit in, in Uganda, uh, which is like a small scale unit of Black Soldier Rally set up. So we were also trying out different market waste. Or from from the markets in Kampala to see how much biomass or how much of the larvae that we would harvest from that that unit. So just to summarize very quickly, as I receive questions later, we found that okay, there is high interest overall, and this is not new because even there was an, another perception survey that was done by colleagues from Makere. They, they, the Ugandans, the utilization of insects is not a new concept, I think, which applies to all other African countries. However, the, there is a problem in terms of knowledge because people ke kept to be, they were kind of unsure whether it was something they could also manage and, and rare. Availability of the larvae was a challenge. Uh, for now, at least, it was only at experimental stages, maybe if you find the university, they didn't know that they can easily find this even in their environments back at home. And then some of them were like, okay, if the price of the black soldier fly is going to be less than the price of the silver fish, then we could probably consider, this was mainly coming from the people who were formulating the feeds. So we took those views and then also ask us, uh, profiled the potential buyers, ask them, okay, if who would buy this black soldier fly in the current setup of the Ugandan situation? They were mainly people with low income and, and they were mainly people who were managing poultry or opigari businesses from medium to large. By medium to large, I can give background information. The culture of, uh, the culture of feed formulation, there are commercial e companies that are making feeds in Uganda, but majority of people, because of fear of adulteration and quality of the feeds, 
they have decided to start uh, formulating most of their feeds. So it's only the small, most of the small scale that buy the feeds from the commercial. So, and then they set a price. Of course, the, the farmer always wants a lower price from 2000 to 1000 to 2000. That is around 0 0.23 cents to 155 cents of the US dollar. So, we, so they wanted something of low cost. So we picked those costs everywhere and, and, and put them in the linear programming model while putting cost and quality and using the GAMS system, which formulates feeds, not compromising quality. Found that in models where, of course, even, even fish was included among them. In models where we put the black soldier fly, the, the farmer would be able to save up to 57% of the cost. Of course, we picked the commercial cost of the other prices within Uganda, Ugandan market situation, but we can try for other places. It replaced the fish, so you will not see the fish, uh, the model picking the fish. So that means the quality of the black soldier fly, it approves with what is in literature, it was be, it would, it will be able to be replaced by the black soldier fly. The challenge, however, is the farmer has to, in hygiene, in hygiene and storage and management, because in the process of preserving that larvae, we dry it, and that might affect the amino acid low protein component. In it. So that has to be controlled, because once the, the one of the amino acids lysine or methionine is low, then the model doesn't pick out the black soldier fly. So. As the way forward, what I've realized from my own experience uh, in this is that, okay, it's possible to have, the background picture is the, the, the low cost unit that we have. It's possible to rare black soldier fly commercially, but there is need for one, to work on the, to work on the technology that is cheap. So with that one we developed, it is at around 300 USD to set up everything plus the containers. Then the farmer will be able to get in every one kilogram, the, like if in Ugandan shillings, you put five kilograms of substrate, you get one kilogram of the, the biomass. But then they need, there's need also for knowledge because like other, and unlike other enterprises that have a lot of knowledge easily available, how to start and everything, we had challenges in Uganda, even for me, who's a, uh, a professional. I, I, there was a lot of myths and theories around rearing, and people were suggesting very expensive combinations of feeds. Whereas there are published feeds in literature, they are mainly lab-based. So going on forward from here, we are going to continue to, 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 to complete the data for this that was interfered with the COVID outbreak and then complete the model and, and be able to disseminate a working small scale model that farmers can use for rearing on commercial scales and see how to pull women groups and everything. Whereas if you look at um, West, people generally when you're driving through cities, you might think the West is available. One challenge we got also was when they, they were collecting West, there was competition for that West. There are people who are feeding animals direct the same waste. So it is, it's not, there is a system in the market for that waste. So I, in the, my going forward, we are going to look into mechanisms of how to organize domestic households of Uganda, especially in peri-urban or urban areas, to collect some of their, their, their organic waste so that we can use it for, for the, the, the food waste and see incentives on how to collect that. Because the market waste, there was high competition. People are giving it to livestock, dairy cows, and, and so the prices. That's why we had, you have to buy it. It, it can be conflicting. So I, I welcome more questions. I, in the meantime, I want to give special thanks to AAP for the sponsorship, Makerere team for continuous support and continuously giving uh, more especially the head of department, Dr. Rosa Zuba, and the dean, Professor Toyonjere, and then my mentor, Professor Michael Chaido, and the team at RTC that I lead, uh, the, the, that, that I work with, sorry, and our leader, Prof. Dr. Patrick Rodrigo, 
Then at MSU, Eric Benbo, Jane, and Matthew Grishop, and African Futures. Because uh, I, I think it has been a tough time for me, a bit, and a good time also in terms of working here. So I appreciate the questions that come thereafter. Thank you. Well, no, th thank you, Deborah, uh, for again uh, uh, tackling a very important subject uh, for African development. Uh, a very important priority of uh, interest, insects for food and feed for Africa, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, recycling uh, waste in the urban cities, or indeed, uh, you know, as uh, you know, an activity that is beginning to generate uh, new livelihood opportunities for, you know, communities, uh, especially you know, women. Um, farmers who may need to get into this uh, particular space. Um, but again, um, I, I think just to, for the uh, benefit of the, 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 the uh, uh, participants uh, in this panel, just to say that uh, Deborah, uh, with her mentor, have managed to mobilize additional resources uh, to continue with uh, this research. Uh, and again, another testimony to the importance of the work uh, these uh, scholars are doing. Uh, you know, uh, and I think congratulations to you, Deborah. And, uh, you are a mentor. Um, we, we look forward again to um, engaging you further uh, around uh, the excellent work you are doing. Uh, we can move on now to, uh, you know, look at another very important uh, uh, agri uh, food system area, uh, and uh, this will be presented by Dr. Ndeye Penda Ndiaye, uh, who is uh, a researcher and lecturer in the Department of Biology at Sheikh Doop University in Dakar. Um, she is actually uh, a top scientist looking at uh, genetics of livestock. Uh, and uh, clearly, again, you know, a very you know, important uh, field where there are not too many uh, female scientists in that particular space. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Ndeye. Uh, please um, proceed with uh, your presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Risha. Um, first of all, welcome to everyone to our African Futures Research Dissemination Workshop. Today, I am going to present to you the results of one of my research project carried out during my one year research training at Michigan State University as the context of learning modern genomic analysis and their applications in livestock species. This research work was about the genetic characterization and selection signatures of Korean and American pig breeds and completed under the supervision of Professor Cedric Gondro. In recent years, intensive artificial selection based on modern breeding practice has caused accumulation of inbreeding and reduction of genetic diversity in commercial pig breeds. The advances in genomic technologies and molecular information over the past several years provide high density single nucleotide polymorphism panels for livestock species. SNP ships enable to estimate efficiently the effects of selection and genetic drive on livestock genome diversity. According to this context, the aim of this study was to characterize the genetic diversity, population structure, and identify selection signatures of Korean and American pig breeds using 
SNPs markers. The sampling of animals was randomly done in commercial farms in South Korea and United States. And animal were selected from six different breeds. Two Korean land race and Yorkshire, and four American land race, Yorkshire, Darok, and Amsha. After the genotyping of animals, the genotype data were submitted to quality control and resulted in a pool of 45,000. 536 SNPs and 5,368 animals. To perform population genetics analysis, Microsoft are open software and necessary R packages were used. After performing the population genetics analysis, the following results were obtained. Um, as given the table one, the mean values of parameters such as observed heterozygosity, gene diversity, and the inbreeding coefficient showed that American and Korean pig breeds are characterized by low levels of genetic diversity that might be caused by intensive selection for productivity. On figure one, the average linkage disequilibrium plot against the physical distance between pair of SNPs display high level of ILD caused by an increase of inbreeding, which reduce the genetic diversity and might affect negatively the health and reproduction of animals. On figure two, the high level of linkage disequilibrium lead to a strong decrease of the effective population size assimilated to the effects of genetic draft. In these slides, the most significant selected regions and candidate genes under selection are summarized in table two. And on figure three, we have the genome wide distribution of all potential selected regions with a FST value beyond the cutoff of 0.64. The significant linkage disequilibrium variation observed within three megabars pairs of SNPs distance resulted in highly selected genomic regions, mainly distributed on chromosomes 1 and 16. The 36 candidate genes identify within the 15 significant selected uh, regions are putatively associated with fatness, leanness, growth race, anatomy, blood parameter, and reproductive traits. After quantifying the within breed genetic diversity estimates, breed phylogenetic relationships were investigated at two levels, populations and individuals. On figure four, 
we have three phylogenetic trees. A represent the genetic distance tree for all populations, and BAC represent the allele sharing trees for all individuals. Phylogenetic trees for individuals revealed clearly two major clusters. The Korean Yorkshire and American Yorkshire breeds group together in the cluster one, while the Korean Landrace with the other three American breed cluster together in the cluster two. The close genetic relationships within Landrace breeds and within Yorkshire breeds reflect the demographic history since South Korea is known to import pigs from international countries, including US. In this slides, the results of population structure obtained from the principal components analysis and the admixture analysis are presented. On the PCA plot, the first components which account for 94% of the total genetic variation separated clearly the Korean and the American Yorkshire breeds from the other four populations. Therefore, PCA and admixture results confirm well the same hierarchical clustering as did phylogenetic inferences. On the admixture plot, population structure at K equal to four ancestries indicated that the American Darug and American M. Sheer breed share the same ancestral population with 0.62% of variation between them. The current structure of genomic diversity of Korean and American peak breeds are consequences of significant variance in allele frequencies caused by strong artificial selection. To sum up, modern genomic analysis and their applications in livestock species have broad impacts that can contribute to the development of breeding and management, to the development of breeding, management, and conservation program in a imponent uh, livestock species in Senegal. Therefore, we can distinguish main impacts that can use for livestock species development. Two of them are to make a decision from breeding management and conservation programs. And this can uh, be taken from the application of genetic diversity, population structure, selection signatures, the case of this present studies. The other applications facilitate to improve industries outcome through genomic prediction. Um, just to recall that all these applications are tightly linked. And um, uh, they, uh, they use efficiently to improve our livestock species. 
I end up this presentation by expressing my sincere thanks to the Alliance for African Partnership for funding this postdoctoral fellowships. Thanks to the Michigan State University and the Department of Animal Science for offering me this opportunity of learning um, new skills in animal uh, breeding and genetics and doing research. I also want to extend my gratitude and thanks to my mentor, Professor Cedric Gondro and his research team. Thanks are also due to my UCAT mentor, Professor Semben, to the AAP focal point at UCAT, Professor Mbaye, and all my African future scholars colleagues. Thanks. You, no, thank you very much, uh, and, and they, I think for this, uh, again, extremely important uh, area of study on uh, genetic diversity of uh, livestock breeds, uh, I think uh, you will definitely, and you are uh, an outstanding, uh, uh, you know, model, um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, for aspiring young women who might want to get in uh, this uh, highly scientific field. Now, I'm sure there'll be many questions coming up uh, for, um, you know, relating to your presentation. I think, uh, we should move on to uh, the next uh, presentation uh, from, uh, you know, Sensia John, uh, who is an economist and lecturer at University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, um, you know, to, to speak to some of uh, her work uh, around uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, value chains, but uh, focus on uh, agricultural uh, systems through agricultural uh, sustainable intensification. Uh, so, in a sense, yeah, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Richard. Um, my presentation today is going to be on um, the Malawian um, systems and how we can transform the agricultural system through um, sustainable intensification. And my mentors are Professor uh, Siglin Snap and Professor Reza Lukina from University of Dar es Salaam. And um, to start, um, the research work has been under the African Research in the Sustainable Intensification for Next Generation project um, in short Africa Rising, which uh, was established since 2012 and with the baseline study done in 2013. Um, in central and south Malawi. And um, it's a mother baby trial um, participatory work, action work, which um, also involved agroecological approaches. Um, so the first, uh, it had to, my research work had two parts where we had the mother trials of um, 21 farmers that was established in 2012 up to 2020, recently, where we got our very recent data set. And then the panel surveys that started off with the baseline study in the central Malawi in 2013-2014 um, uh, with 296 um, households um, collected from 2015 to 2019. And from South Malawi, where South region of Malawi, where we had 354 households in the South region collected from 2017 to 2019. Um, we couldn't collect the 2020 data sets because of the impact of COVID-19 to be able to do um, a face-to-face -face interview with these farmers. But we have managed to do uh, phone interviews um, with these farmers using some of the researchers in Malawi. So looking at, the, at these two sets of uh, research, um, for the mother trial, which has been established for, uh, for, since 2012, um, using uh, a randomized uh, complete block design, um, an action research. Um, uh, in, this, in the results that I'll present, the key objective we were trying to look at is how can we identify sustainable intensification interventions for marginal areas in order to address sustainable manners of food security, nutrition, and the income requirements among these poor vulnerable farmers. And the panel survey, we are trying to look at how um, the participatory action um, extension has actually affected um, the adoption of sustainable identification technologies 
for three groups um, of um, participating who are the intervention group, a local and a distance control farmers um, of these technologies. So looking at these different sites, um, the mother trial sites um, were from um, central Malawi, where we had four um, EPAs, which is the extension um, areas in Malawi. And we had Lienzi, Pegolomonti, Kandewe, and Sipe. So um, as you can see, um, these sites were then re um, redefined using the average maize yields produced by the different farmers where we potentially had high potential areas and medium, medium and low potential areas, to, which were categorized according to the average maize that these farmers produced. And then um, for the panel survey sites, um, as I explained uh, previously, we had three groups, the participating farmers who were in the intervention group, and then we had the local control farmers, and then we had the distance control farmers. In the central, we had two districts. We had Dedza district with two EPAs, Golomoti and Lentipe, and the Intechu Ucheo district, which had uh, Nsipe and Kandeo um, EPAs. And in the southern region, we had the Machinga district, which had Nyambi, Nsanama, and Ntumbui um, EPAs. So you can see from the map that the distance control are a bit further away from the local and the intervention group in order to see how the participatory extension ha actually how did it affect the adoption of these farmers um, adopting the sustainable identification technologies. So um, discussing the results that we obtained from the mother trial sites, uh, we looked at um, six um, key um, cropping systems, which is the maize, uh, continuous maize unfertilized. We had the maize, continuous maize fertilized, we have the double up legume, which is the groundnut and pigeon pea rotation with maize. We have the groundnut um, and maize um, rotation. We have the pigeon pea and maize rotation and the maize intercrop system, which were um, annualized in a two year based rotation. So from the left hand side of the uh, box plot, you can see that the grain yields, the results um, explained that um, any system with legumes um, um, performed better than maize unfertilized. But um, taking into account the environment case, we can see that farmers in Malawi are more better off um, growing um, a, a system of groundnuts in a low um, potential area environment where they were more able to get higher yields of maize and potential yields of groundnuts. The same also was in um, high yielding environment, but in a high yielding environment, the pigeon pea systems were actually better performing than a continuous maize um, system, a continuous maize uh, unfertilized system. Um, similar, uh, similarly, we can see for protein contribution that um, groundnut systems, systems with groundnut, meaning uh, a groundnut and pigeon pea um, intercropped with, rotated with maize, uh, we're better off in uh, protein contribution um, for both low and high medium environment and overall. So in conclusion, we can conclude that um, groundnut systems were actually better off in providing yields in a low um, marginal environment and as well in protein contribution for these farmers instead of growing um, continuous maize unfertilized or growing maize um, fertilized. So doing an economic analysis um, to determine which um, systems were actually more profitable to these farmers to actually um, see if they were better off growing um, a maize um, unfertilized system, or was it better for them to grow actually a maize fertilized system? Understanding the fact that may, um, fertilize, fertilizer is expensive, but also the government of Malawi um, had a, a program where it subsidizes its farmers to access fertilizer as well as maize hybrid system and rarely uh, improved legume system. So the Africa Rising project actually um, enabled this by providing seeds to these farmers to be able to grow legume systems. So um, taking into account the different costs of fertilizer seeds and the labor costs that these farmers incurred to be able to produce um, the different system. From a mother uh, trial based um, approach, 
we can see that um, using a subset of the farmers that actually practice all the systems, um, there was no significant difference of a farmer that grew a legume system and a maize fertilized system. But however, there was a very clear distinction of farmers who actually grew a legume system to those that continu um, continuously grew an unfertilized maize system. So it's safe to say that um, farmers were better off growing a legume system um, than continuously growing maize, um, since they were able to capably to get um, legume and maize at the same time, which in this case, meaning that they were able also to get a protein contribution in their households. Um, for the panel survey results, um, I have not produced the tables um, for the, um, the results, but we ran a five model where we use a generalized linear mixed effect model and a linear mixed effect model for five um, sustainable identification technologies, which was rich spacing, um, legume choice, pigeon pea um, choice, um, plant population, and compost use, which was used as a, a control technology for these farmers. So uh, why did we choose pigeon pea choice? So pigeon pea was introduced um, as a nitrogen fixation legume crop in Malawi when the African Arising Project uh, was initiated in Malawi as a way of doing integrated nutrient management. So from the results, um, as I said earlier, that we are trying to look at what is the impact of these uh, participatory action research for these um, households in adapting these different SI technologies. So one of the key um, um, results from this was that there was actually a significant effect of uh, participatory um, extension services and those, th this was uh, attributed also by a significant difference among the groups, where, for instance, from the central uh, region, we can see that um, there was intense um, um, participatory um, extension effect um, by the uh, participating um, group, which was then um, spread, wide spreading to the local and the distance control areas, and also um, in the south region, region, which is an area where um, most of the farmers actually practiced a lot of legume cultivation, we can see that um, there wasn't significant impact on the number of legumes that they increased over time, but actually there was a very huge intensification in terms of pigeon pea population that was increased due to extension advice. And there was also uh, an, um, an increased um, close reach spacing in both areas. And central um, region, which was uh, actually a region where most of the peoples did not actually um, practice legume cultivation, we could see a very good increased legume choice in, in the central with an increased um, pigeon pea adoption um, over time and over space. Uh, and this was attributed by the effect of uh, participatory extension and, and traditional extension advice, which um, did not actually have an effect, which um, gave us um, a chance to actually conclude that there was a need for more and further participatory um, research, I mean, extension approach. So what are the, are the key messages? So for Malawian farmers that um, actually uh, practice a lot of maize-based system farming, it is safe to say that um, if they include groundnut systems, either through double up legume, that is a groundnut and pigeon pea intercrop rotated with maize, or a groundnut in rotation with um, maize, it was, better, it was a better performing system than if they only grew a continuous maize in terms that it can be grown in marginal areas, um, sites like Golomoti, which are characterized by very low rainfall patterns and um, um, high evaporation. And they, they are, they'll be able to only, not only get high yield grains, but they will also get a good protein contribution. And these systems as well, um, the legume systems, um, um, actually face a very high good price. So they are good income contributions to these farmers compared to continuous uh, unfertilized maize, which um, they, have, they have always been fluctuating maize prices. 
another key finding and the takeaway message is that um, a bottom bottom up extension system, um, in our case, participatory extension services, um, is more likely to improve the adoption of, of SI technologies, and it can be seen from the Malawi uh, government. A, a top bottom system did not work for extension delivery. So a participatory extension service is more likely to improve the adoption of these different technologies that are being introduced uh, by different researchers. And it's also a way for the scientists and the different communities and farmers to actually learn from one another while introducing these technologies. And um, one important um, aspect is that um, the overall wealth had no effect and soil type only influence intensification but not um, sustainable intensification. So I would also like to acknowledge the Alliance for African Partnership, my mentors from MSU, uh, Professor Sidlin Snap, um, who has really, really um, helped me a lot to take me through this. I have learned a lot of softwares which I've, I have used um, in my analysis. And also my uh, Professor Raza Klokina, who has been a very great help in the econometrics and the analysis that I've done. But mostly, I would also like to thank you, uh, thank the SNAP Lab group, um, which has been a very, very, very collaborative um, group for working. Um, and they have really helped me a lot because uh, I'm an agri economist and working with agroecologists for me has been very interesting. And I would like to thank Regis Chiko, um, Vimbai Chimoy, Chimoyo, Vince, Alison, Chiwimbole, Alexia, and Shingi. And for their very, very good contribution and help um, in my uh, work. And for more um, information, kindly visit the Center for Global Change and Earth Observation, where you will find a number of publications and um, a lot of partners that we, have, we, we keep working with. And, um, a lot of research information about the Africa Rising research work that was established in 2012 until date. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again, Innocencia, uh, for that uh, presentation. Again, a powerful reminder that uh, there's more uh, to enhancing agriculture productivity than uh, the continued uh, just a reliance on uh, fertilizers. Uh, those uh, you know, intensification interventions are equally important to enhancing agriculture productivity in Africa. Billions have been spent uh, on subsidies, uh, and uh, I think you're challenging governments that uh, they need to begin to look at uh, alternatives um, in uh, enhancing agriculture productivity in the continent. Uh, we would like to, to move on uh, to the next uh, presentation, um, uh, and that will be uh, Dr. Emilia Ngozi Odo uh, from, again, University of Nigeria, uh, Nsuka. Uh, she's actually a public health specialist, uh, you know, with an interest in um, uh, sexual and reproductive health, uh, including maternal health. Um, please, over to you, uh, Emilia. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay, welcome everyone to this presentation. Our study is on maternal dietary B vitamin and infant morbidity among breastfeeding mother infant diets in Northern Kenya. Actually, this is a part of a bigger study that is looking at um, association between maternal micronutrient deficiencies and infant health. Globally, there has been a, a reduction, a decrease in under five and infant mortality, but South Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, South Asia still have the highest risk of a child dying before the age of five. And most of these deaths occur within the first year of life, which is at infancy, and from preventable diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea diseases, and um, malaria. And the prevention of these diseases are uh, of great importance to public health because it is one of the key uh, strategies to achieving uh, sustainable development growth threat. And one of the major 
uh, strategies to reduce these diseases among infants is uh, improving maternal micronutrient deficiency. Uh, maternal micronutrient intake of uh, these uh, vitamins, example, the B vitamin. So we think that this is very important because maternal nutrition has been linked to infant health, growth, and development. And while there are some strategies to improve maternal uh, micronutrient status during pregnancy, less attention has been given to intake of these um, micronutrients postnatal, especially the B vitamin. We have um, supplementation of B vitamin during pregnancy where we give our mothers like B vitamin B -co. we give them folic acid and multivitamin. But do, um, after the childbirth, there is less attention to whether these mothers take this or even take foods that are rich in these micronutrients. And in Africa, we have a lot of uh, local and cultural foods that can give us or give mothers these micronutrients. But we are not ignorant of the fact that there are ecological and socioeconomic factors like drought and poverty in Africa, which can influence the availability and accessibility to these um, foods that are rich in these micronutrients. So our study aims, this particular one aims at finding association between maternal dietary intake of vitamin B12 and folate. Folate is vitamin B9 and infant feeding practices and morbidity during drought drought induced food scarcity in northern Kenya. During this period, there was a very, uh, there was some um, um, damage to food crops and you know, life, uh, what do you call it, the livestock. So mothers had challenges taking enough uh, micronutrients. So we had three objectives and uh, three hypotheses where we First, evaluated maternal characteristics that are associated with adequate vitamin B12 and folate intake. We assumed here that maternal intake of food varieties of food varieties would predict adequate vitamin B12 or folate. We also evaluated if foods that women fed their infants were similar as those they took. We here we assumed that maternal intake of these foods would be associated with the infant feeding practices. And we also evaluated um, maternal, if maternal vitamin B12 or folate intake would be associated with infant morbidity. We assumed that maternal adequate um, vitamin B12 and folate would be protective against morbidities among children. This is a cross-sectional study, actually, where we used uh, archived data from aerial mother-infant diets, was from the Mazabi um, district of Northern Kenya during 2006 Horn of African drought. The, this district is mainly housing an uh, agro-pastoral settlement. And because of the drought during, uh, because of the drought in 2006, their livestock and crops were affected. Mothers faced challenges of even finding good foods to eat. So our variables, we looked at uh, maternal characteristics like food groups, and we identified 10 common food groups in the area and we concentrated more on um, foods that are rich in vitamin B12 and folate. And we used meat or fish as rich source of vitamin B12 and pulses or not, or beans as we call it in some African countries, as a uh, rich source of um, folate, which is the B9. Then we looked at, we calculated the dietary diversity score. Dietary diversity score, DGS, 
is used to show the quality of diet and is based on how many food groups that a mother can put in, a di in her diet. And we also calculated the nutrient content from 24-hour dietary record using NutriSurvey software. In infant complementary feeding, we also looked at those food groups that were similar as that of the mother that are rich in vitamin B12 and vitamin B9 folate. Then infant morbidity variable, we looked at um, presence or absence of fever, diarrhea, or cough. And these were from 10 days morbidity record. All the data were available at Biomarker Laboratory for Anthropological Research, which has uh, the PI as my mentor, Dr. Fujita. So we analyzed our data using chi-square, t-test, and regression model. We found out that only 14% of these mothers had adequate vitamin B12, while 68% had adequate fluid. And among those um, who had adequate vitamin B12, majority of them uh, included meat or fish in their diet, while majority of those who had adequate folate had um, included beans or, or pulses or not in their diet. And also we found out that majority of those who had uh, vitamin B12, adequate vitamin B12, were less likely to be poor. Therefore, poverty was a factor in inclu uh, including meat or fish in the diet. So the DSS, DDS, I mean to say, and pulses or not predicted adequate folate, adequate vitamin B12, but in different direction. Why the DDS, which is the, 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 the dietary diversity score, why it increased the odds of having adequate vitamin B12, pulses or not decreased the odds of having adequate vitamin B12. Meanwhile, in this model, um, fish or meat was removed because it's perfectly predicted uh, having adequate vitamin B12. Then DDS and meat or fish predicted adequate folate, but still in different direction. Why DDS increased uh, the odds of having adequate folate, meat or fish decreased the odds of having adequate folate. And pulses or not was removed from the model because it perfectly predicted the adequate folate. So in other words, the higher the DDS, the, higher, the greater the chances of a mother, including both um, meat, uh, fish, and pulses or not. So it, what it means is that uh, including varieties of uh, food group in a diet will give you both vitamin B12 and folate. We found out that maternal adequate vitamin B12 or folate was not associated with what they fed the infant. And surprisingly, we, we, our study found out that adequate vitamin B12 was associated with higher, uh, with higher also of uh, infant fever. This is what we uh, even recommending that if, uh, another study could be done to see clearly what is um, what yeah, actually is the conclusion. We cannot conclude that vitamin B12 is the cause of the fever because we didn't rule out every other infection. Folate was not significantly associated with any of the morbidity variables, whether fever, call for diarrhea. So we conclude that it seems that mothers were compromising between eating any, either they take um, meat or fish or they include meat, um, they include beans or pulses in their food, but not taking both of them. And we conclude that this um, could be um, the reason why we didn't even see any relationship or any association with, between mothers 
uh, intake of these vitamins and what they fed their, their babies. Maybe they were not taking the other one in order to give their infants or not. And we also have it that the association between vitamin B12 and uh, infant morbidity is a very complex one. And we would also say here that we cannot conclude that maternal vitamin B12 is associated with uh, or causes um, infant morbidity. So other studies that may use something like um, RCT is recommended for this. And as I said earlier, this is just a part of uh, what we are doing. And so currently we have other studies like um, we are exploring an association between maternal B vitamin and breast, uh, breast milk immune components such as lactoferrin we also intended doing SIG. And again, we are looking at maternal infant and infant illness in relation to lactoferrin concentration in human milk. What are we doing here? We are using um, milk specimen of these mothers. We have really uh, completed the assay at uh, the milk specimen. We are still we are still archived in uh, Blal, and we have done all the laboratory analysis before the COVID. We were lucky to do that before the COVID struck, and uh, we are compiling our results currently for this. It's a very big study. All we are doing is to have a, um, a healthy mother and healthy baby. And um, with this, the actualization of uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3 may be in view or real, um, as we can say that we are get, uh, getting towards that. And I would like to thank um, everyone for listening. I would like to thank MSU, AAP, the team has been a very great one. Jose, your team is very good, very lovely people and uh, dedicated staff. VIPP, I wouldn't uh, like not to mention you because you made our stay here in the first few weeks we arrived, very peaceful and we like you people. Yeah, I want to thank the anthropology department for really hosting me and Ibla. Ibla is biomarker laboratory for anthropological research. See me from the Department of Human Kinetics and Health Education, a public health educator now in anthropology department. I really love being there. You people are so wonderful. Dr. Fujita and Nelly, even Gazana, all of you, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, MSU, for this great opportunity. Thank you, UNN, for releasing me to be here. My department, Department of Human Kinetics and Health Education, the present HOD and the past HOD, thank you so much. The Faculty of Education, Dean, present and past, and the focal person, uh, AAP focal person, UNN. Thank you so much. I want to thank my mentors who have been so great. Dr. Fujita, you are such a wonderful person. You work so hard. And I want to talk, thank uh, Dr. Evelyn for her support down there at UNN and even as I am here. So I would also like to thank uh, Institute for Global Health for giving me the opportunity to be part of their global health studies during this period. I want to thank Dr. Rebecca for this great opportunity and also for um, collaborating with me in a study which we are going to do in UNN next year. We just won the grant. I will be very happy to have you in my department next year. Thank you, my family, for the sacrifice and for the support. It has been so good. I don't know that I could be away for this long time, but I thank you for being there for me and for my friends. I want to mention one person here who was instrumental to me for it was instrumental for me to be here, Dr. Eberi Adimora. She really encouraged me to apply for this and I, I didn't regret it. Thank you everyone and God bless you. Well, thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Emilia. Um, 
you know, this again, very, very powerful uh, on uh, the, I think, important role of macronutrients uh, to food security and reduction of morbidity, uh, especially among our children, a very important area for national, of national and, and uh, continental interest. Um, you know, I'm sure there'll be many, many questions arising. Um, you know, we, we trust that uh, you know, you'll respond to those. Um, uh, last but not least, uh, I would like us uh, to move on to Gertrude Mpwande, Dr. Gertrude Mpwande, who is a lecturer at uh, the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, Gertrude um, um, has actually recently um, been uh, uh, registered uh, as a di dietrics, di dietrician, um, you know, and would like to congratulate her uh, for, for accomplishing uh, both uh, her research work, but also being a, a formally registered, registered uh, di di dietrics uh, uh, specialist. Um, the, the first, by the way, in Malawi, so this is quite remarkable. I, again, a testimony to the importance of this uh, particular program. Uh, so uh, Gertrude, please uh, proceed uh, to speak to urban and semi-urban food, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, food challenges and, and uh, diseases and so on. Um, get rid. All right, let me. I hope you can see my presentation, right? No, we're not able to. Um, Oh gosh. Gertrude, I can share it for you. I have it up. I improved it, so I don't know what's happening from my side. Can you see it now? Oh. Yes, we're able to. You can oh. see my presentation? I can share it from my side and then you can just speak to it. I improved my PowerPoint, that's why I'm saying. I don't know what's happening from my side. Oh, there, now we can see it. You can see it, right? Yep. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, once again, I'm uh, Gertrude Impuante from the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and uh, Natural Resources, Rwanda, in Malawi. Uh, before I start my presentation, really, I would like to mention that uh, as part of the fellowship, I've spent 10 months working in the hospitals, uh, communities, as well as uh, in schools, as part of uh, my supervised practice in dietetics, so that I should get registered as a dietitian. Uh, the part that there is, the re research that I'll present today is part of the study, which was conducted in uh, 2017 in Malawi, and this, and it was a uh, a clinical study. Now my focus, it will be on our food insecurity, our food acquisition and type two diabetes management, especially focusing on our urban and semi-urban population uh, in Malawi. Well, uh, food insecurity poses a challenge in achieving optimal blood glucose control, especially for adults with uh, type two diabetes. However, studies have indicated that uh, uh, food insecure urban Malawians, the diet is uh, high in uh, refined and uh, processed uh, food, uh, which poses uh, a challenge in achieving optimal blood glucose control and uh, increasing susceptibility to poor health outcomes. And besides that, uh, there are competing uh, priorities uh, such as access to uh, healthy foods and uh, healthy expenses, which also uh, poses additional challenges in uh, achieving a uh, healthy diet for optimal uh, blood glucose control among adults with uh, type 2 uh, diabetes in Malawi. Uh, therefore, uh, this study, basically we are looking at uh, 
assessing food uh, insecurity and how is that relating to their blood glucose control uh, using graxated hemoglobin as a long-term marker of blood glucose control for a period of two to three months, which is also a good standard marker when it comes to diabetes management. And besides that, we also looked at a household food acquisition and how is that related to our diabetes management as well as our blood glucose control. As already indicated, this study was done in Malawi, especially the central part of Malawi, which is a yellow part in, this, uh, in the graph, and it was done in two hospitals, especially in government operated hospitals because the cost of care is being incurred by the government. And it was done in Kasungu, which was denoted as a semi-urban, and uh, in Lilongwe, which was denoted as a urban. Uh, what did we find out from there? Regardless of where someone is, either is staying in the urban or semi-urban, they still experience some sort of food insecurity, but uh, moderate to severe food inse insecurity was more prevalent in the semi-urban population, impacting their blood glucose control. Besides looking at uh, food insecurity, we looked at the diet, and uh, we found out that for those that are managing well diabetes, which is uh, denoted by the uh, A1C less 8, and those that are not managing well A1C greater 8%, uh, intake of cereals, which is high in uh, carbohydrates, and intake of roots and tubers, also high in carbohydrates, and intake of uh, sweet and uh, uh, sweetened beverages were high in those that are not managing well diabetes, indicating that uh, the food choices that they have had an impact on blood glucose control. Uh, besides just looking at food insecurity and uh, food and consumption, we looked at uh, where do they acquire the food in terms of uh, food purchase, basically, we found out that for those that were food insecure, food purchase were the predominant source. Then we went further to find out where do they buy the food. But we found out that uh, sweetened beverages and sweet food were purchased from their small grocery shops within their residential areas, while fruits and vegetables were purchased from the open local markets. Then we went further looking into, apart from purchase, what other source of food that you have at household level? And from production perspective, most of them, they, they indicated, majority indicated that they purchase, uh, they, they do produce maize and legumes for household, for household consumption. But when we look further into nutrition perspective uh, and uh, diabetes management, uh, production of only maize and legume, yes, it will provide extra proteins and uh, extra micronutrients. But when you look into diabetes management, this would not provide adequate diversified diet for someone to have an optimal glycemic control. Therefore, they would depend much of their food from purchase. Uh, then an, a, a question was raised as, was, is this food insecurity associated with their blood glucose control as well as the diversity of the diet? Uh, what we found out is that uh, Indeed, uh, when someone is food insecure, they were not diversifying their diet very well, which also impacted their glycemic control, indicating that for those that were food insecure, they were more likely not to manage diabetes well because they were compromising their diet. In summary, I would say that uh, food security in Malawi, regardless of location, regardless of condition, it's there. What, and it, it impacted their food, pro, their, uh, food purchases. As indicated, there was low, food, low dietary diversity, consumption of high refined carbohydrates, uh, sweet food, and they were purchasing high carbohydrate and sweet food basically from the local grocery stores within their residential areas. And this impacted their, uh, their glycemic uh, status, leading to an acceptable glycemic control, which in the long term may lead to complications such as kidney failure, blindness, as well as amputation. Uh, therefore, the key message is that for health professionals in Malawi, as they are providing nutrition education as in terms of diabetes management, issues of food choices uh, should be incorporated into it, as well as this forms a, a, a basis for further studies on how food environment, such as markets and stores, can better assist those with data-related non-communicable diseases uh, such as the two diabetes in Malawi.
uh, other milestones, as indicated, I spent 10 months of my stay here at uh, Michigan doing my supervised practice. Uh, five months I've spent it in the hospital. Uh, this, uh, the first picture is me providing diabetes education uh, during my uh, outpatient, di during outpatient diabetes clinic. While the second part, it was my part of my food service, looking at consumption of fruits and vegetables among our high school students. Uh, I was there again, providing nutrition education. Besides that, I managed to uh, write three papers of which all of them have been accepted for publication. And in addition to that, a follow up to the research that I've just presented, uh, we wrote a grant proposal looking at how can we develop a nutrition education a tool to teach people on diet related non communicable diseases and how is it related to food uh, choices and food insecurity in Malawi. Uh, uh, reaching this far, I would like to thank AAP uh, and uh, uh, Michigan State University, the Department of Food, food Science and Human Nutrition for, for the uh, support. And my mentors are uh, Dr. Roren Weatherspoon and Dr. Alexander Karimbira. Uh, for the support that they have offered me throughout my, they started with me from my PhD now through the postdoc as well. Uh, my lab mates, uh, Gail, Dian, and uh, Makafuli, and uh, my colleagues from uh, Longo University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, I would like to thank you all for your support. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Gertrude. Uh, th thank you indeed. Again, congratulations, and indeed, congratulations also to your uh, professor, Professor Weatherspoon. Uh, and uh, other colleagues uh, from Oluwana, uh, Dr. Kalimbira and others. Um, uh, and again, a very clear testimony to the value of uh, this great uh, program uh, with uh, you know, people like Gertrude uh, publishing and also um, getting uh, you know, high level additional qualifications uh, over and beyond the, their uh, PhDs. Uh, wonderful. I, I think we can uh, get again to, to questions. Uh, we have a number of uh, questions that are, are coming up. Uh, you know, uh, first, um, the, the, the question goes to Deborah. Um, have extension systems in Uganda taken up the topic of insects for feed? How have you in interacted with the local extensionists to ensure on the ground support for farmers to benefit from this uh, technology? Uh, insects for feed, to what extent uh, have uh, extension systems taken up uh, you know, some of the research you, you're working on? Um, let me just uh, go on uh, to other questions so that uh, uh, the other panelists can begin uh, to reflect on that. Penda, uh, how will the skills and outcomes of the research you did this year impact your future research agenda? What are the questions it opens up for future research that will impact the livestock sector in the Senegal and in the region, because again, your research is relevant, not just to Senegal, but I think to the Saharan region more broadly. Uh, for uh, Inuncia, uh, could you please elaborate further on the participatory methods you use in a, the extension services that, you are, that are, were impactful? How were farmers engaged? What were the key elements of those programs? Uh, a related question you may want to answer relates to uh, how you would like to see, uh, you, how you might scale up uh, some of those uh, interventions uh, to wide, wider geographical areas uh, in, in Malawi. Uh, for Emilia, are there policy implications for your work? What is the role of government public health systems in addressing the findings of your work? Uh, again, Gertrude, uh, one of the key questions that is emerging is, uh, are you seeing any gender differences around consumption choices, nutrition, and di diabetes management? Additionally, do you see an urban-rural divide uh, in some of your work? Uh, I know there's a lot of questions. Uh, if you can be very brief in your answer, uh, because um, you know time is not uh, with us, so please uh, be brief. Uh, starting with uh, Penda. Yes. Thank you, Risha. 
ama from these uh, skills that I get uh, from uh, modern genomic analysis, I think it would be useful for my uh, future research project. Because you know, um, uh, so far in Senegal, what we are doing to improving uh, lives to breed and mainly in kettles or ships in uh, breeding programs, uh, we used to use the information from uh, uh, phenotype data and uh, some kind of molecular data that uh, didn't concern all the genome or this kind of study concern whole, uh, concern whole, whole genome. In, it means all chromosome and gives you relevant information to improve breed traits of interest. So that's why our breeding programming uh, didn't have uh, much success in improving livestock uh, threat of interest. And I think if I apply it in my uh, research, I think it will increase the breeding values of any kind of livestock breed and mainly in cattle, sheep and poultry because it will have value for industries it would have also value for uh, local farmers because if we uh, if we decide to uh, to put uh, useful strategies for improving this breed, I think with this kind of uh, genomic technologies, we can have uh, more advancement in our. Uh, agriculture and uh, environment development. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a very quick related question uh, to, to you again, Penda, uh, yes. is, uh, you know, uh, as a young science, you know, female scientist, uh, what will you do upon your return to excite and incite, you know, uh, uh, and empower young girls to study science? Um, how can you make even a biology uh, or the work you're doing, uh, you know, uh, friendly, a friendly discipline f that, uh, you know, young women will not shine? Okay, I know. Um, uh, what I learned here is uh, this kind of uh, genomic analysis and genomic technology is associated with some uh, curses that uh, concept to uh, students will need to know it at the early stage, I mean at the undergraduate uh, levels, because this kind of uh, uh, genomic analysis is very expensive and it needs a large number of samples to have appropriate and reliable results. So I think at the undergraduate uh, level at university, we can include in the uh, learning program the basic things and the concept, for example, for quantitative genetics, genomic uh, selection, and genome-wide association studies. And after, at the uh, postgraduate level, they can begin starting uh, doing analysis and learning molecular genomic technologies. I think when they will get, uh, at least as a master, they can have enough uh, tools and skills to work in uh, like uh, to stay in university doing their uh, doc doc doctoral thesis or also working at industries at, at food in as food industries or also uh, working on uh, livestock uh, development organization i think it will be a great opportunity to implement this kind of study at the university and try to help students to be more uh, useful uh, to develop our countries. Yeah, no, th thank you, Penda. Uh, definitely, I mean, we, we will definitely, you know, be looking forward to engaging uh, your vice chancellor uh, further on uh, some of those uh, recommendations you're making. Um, going back to Deborah uh, on our extension systems, how do we really, uh, how does this work uh, move uh, uh, to scale beyond uh, your, uh, you know, experimental work uh, moving into the extension systems? Deborah? Deborah? Okay, sorry, my, my mic was off, I'm on now. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, have the extension systems taken up uh, insects? 
uh, I would say not much because uh, I can count uh, the number of people apart from the unit at Makere University, that is there, there's a research unit, Cabanyolo, and, um, and, and, and some few individual farmers that have been trained by Center for Insect Research. They, they, they are, there is no, like virtually, there is a limited number of people who are even aware of that. So there is no system at the moment for rolling out the, the, these other commercial insects. But I'm talking about specifically in, in context of black soldier fly. For the, for the other, there are other edible insects in Uganda that have at least moved to, they have their own network and system. So, what, to what extent have the systems, but, I, but because of the growing interest in getting the protein from the, from the black soldier fly, I think the, 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 the commissioner, like at the Ministry of Agriculture, they are beginning to pick interest. Although they haven't, like I told you, the bigger challenge is from my experience was the, the, the facts. People didn't have the facts because with extension, you need to first have simplified facts. Go and tell if the farmer says, "Okay, what 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 do I, what do I need to do?" You you need to give the farmer the food, the formula for the feed for the flies. You need to give the farmer the rearing equipment and, and tools. As of now, everybody has perceptions and stereotypes, and some of the information is misleading. And there have been a lot of failures with, especially black soldier fly. It took me to be here at Michigan to to improve and realize it's a very simple fly to rear. Back at home, people were telling us to give things that were even more expensive than what the, 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 the papers are. So I would say the system is still, so there's still a lot of work now to develop a very good approach or system on how to grow the black soldier fly. Because it has avenues. When I had my Innocentia's presentation on fertilizer, the organic waste from black soldier can produce enormous good fertilizer to integrate in, and it might help cut costs in fertilizer waste. So it has a lot of biological applications in Africa, African farming systems. Mm. Have I answered you? Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Deborah. I mean, this is the kind of work which uh, AAP uh, would be keen uh, to follow up because uh, it's not just uh, uh, in Uganda where they're trying black soldier flies. This work is also taking place here in Malawi and uh, would like to benefit from, uh, I think, your reach uh, you know, scientific work you're doing in Uganda, as well as uh, with our colleagues uh, from MSU. So, no, th thank you very much for that. Uh, let's uh, go on to Innocentia. Uh, can you then elaborate further on um, particular methods that you used uh, uh, in uh, the extension services that were impactful? Innocentia? Okay. Thank you so much for the um, for the question, Richard. Um, so, as I explained earlier, um, the main um, um, subject for the research work was transforming the agricultural systems in Malawi. So using sustainable intensification and how did the participatory extension um, services act, um, uh, get involved in all this? So the Africa uh, um, Rising project um, entry point was for um, sustainable intensification of these maize-based farming um, systems. So using integrated uh, nutrient management system, um, fertilizer use or and in combination with the legume presence. So the um, extension service extensions were actually trained on these different um, techniques, um, sustainable intensification um, technologies. And um, the farmers in this case were then given a chance to choose um, what cropping system they would prefer to apply in, the, in, their, in, their, um, in their plots. So the mother, uh, mother trials were like demonstration plots where they demonstrated different um, systems. And then um, the, baby, um, the baby trials were a chance where farmers could actually choose or what kind of systems they, they, they would want to practice. So the extension um, services were now provided through giving them different advice on uh, what crops selection they wanted to choose, um, what rich spacing they, want, uh, they, were, they were more appropriate for them to apply, what plant population, they are actually um, correct to, so as to maximize um, the yield grains. So um, the participatory um, approach um, was a way of farmers and these researchers um, learning on what the farmers preferred 
and what was actually the most correct way to sustainably um, get the, the, the maximum yields um, to be able to get, to, to use uh, like residual management um, ways to actually increase soil fertility. So another key question that I was asked is how can we scale up all this um, um, intervention in Malawi? And I can speak for Tanzania as well, as one of the questions was asked, well, how can I scale it up to Tanzania? So these are the two area, um, areas that have uh, presented uh, as results. But in our further work that I'm doing with Professor Sig is that we are further looking at, um, at Tanzania on the different systems that Tanzania has actually um, has actually used in its cropping systems um, by looking at how different resilient crops like um, sorghum has been actually been able to be integrated with some of the legumes um, in, in for um, to be resilient with climate and to increase soil fertility and as well as maize, uh, I mean, as well as uh, grain yield while at the same time um, being able to have a, um, a good protein contribution to these households. So yeah, so we can um, widespread it through Malawi, but as well as these practices have been actually done in, in Tanzania. And as well, there is a research work um, from Arusha you know, from using lap lap legumes, which, are, which was done by one of the uh, research groups in the Global Center. So it has widely been spread throughout and it's still ongoing research and still more work is, is being done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, th 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 thank you, Inosicia. Um, can we go to em em Emilia? Um, what are the policy implications of, of your work? Um, if you can also speak to uh, uh, how, you know, financially uh, challenged uh, household, poor household, especially women uh, in, uh, you know, rural as well as uh, urban poor uh, household, um, you know, how can they acquire some of these uh, nutritional uh, micronutrients? I mean, we are talking about, um, can you speak to those questions? Thank you for the question. First of all, um, for the policy, uh, we have uh, actually come up with a proposal where we want to conduct um, a research. We are going to develop um, personalized nutrition education because we have seen that the way we give nutrition education to our mothers during antenatal or infant welfare or postnatal services is not really helping issues because each mother has her own peculiar ch nutritional challenge. So I think we are coming up with this because it is very important to take every mother to look at every mother's challenge and provide um, solution sort of or advise mothers on what they can do to, you know, to come up of uh, those challenges. And again, we look at it in the angle that if we develop this um, nutrition, personalized nutrition education, which uh, every primary health care center in our communities should use, that the, it will really inform the policymakers to include this and also to scale it up to maybe national level because our study as we are proposing it is going to be within the Nsuka area. But we think that after that we can really do more scaling it up to national level so that it will be in our health policy that every mother should get this personalized nutrition education whenever the mother comes for either antenatal or infant welfare clinic or postnatal services. And for all women, how uh, we are going to, how well, this study or something like that, we are going to see that poor women or those in um, semi-urban areas have financial access to these nutrients. Yes, if we look at our cultural foods or locally available foods, we have cheap foods that give that are very rich in these micronutrients but the, the issue is that mothers do not know about them so the uh, the major thing is just this nutrition education how do we communicate this to the mothers we need to improve our nutrition education in the health facilities and also in communities so that mothers would know 
that if this uh, vegetable, this livestock, that or this cereal can give me this. For example, mothers, so mothers rear uh, livestock like chicken, but they will not eat. They will go out and sell it and get, let me say, if now in the villages, Indomie is the order of the day. Mm. Why you can, you have what you have, you know, you have in your house, you have your small garden, you have your, your farm that you can actually grow and harvest some of these, uh, you know, some of our local foods that are rich in vitamin, uh, but they do not know it. So we need to um, right. improve on our nutrition education. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. I mean, including, I think, consumption of uh, insects. I, I know in Southern Africa, yes. that's a very, you know, major uh, contribution to increasing micronutrients uh, among, you know, the poor. Uh, let's go to, to Gertrude. Uh, Gertrude, uh, are you seeing any gender differences around consumption choices, nutrition, and diet, diabetes management? Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. I would uh, say that uh, when it came to uh, data diversity, uh, male participants were better off as compared to female participants. However, uh, with further analysis looking into diabetes management with key focus on blood glucose control, there were no significant differences because when it comes to diabetes, the key thing are the major micronutrients, especially the carbohydrates. So even if they were diversifying the diet, you would find out that the food that we are consuming were high in carbohydrates, regardless of being a male or a female. And that really impacted their blood glucose control. And majority of them, their blood glucose control were way beyond the recommendation. I would say 66% of the study population, their blood glucose were above the acceptable level. And most of them, I would wonder why I'm talking to them and yet their graxated hemoglobin is very critical. It was really an issue of the food choices and based on the nutrient composition, especially the carbohydrates, which is basically impacted by the uh, diabetes management. Now, when it comes to rural and urban, of course, uh, the urban were better in terms of uh, uh, choose in terms of dietary diversity as compared to rural. As already indicated that in terms of our food security as well, that the urban were even better as compared to, to the semi-urban. However, comparing the two in terms of blood glucose control, there were no significant differences. All of them were like managing it poorly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, absolutely. Um, we're now coming uh, to the end of uh, this wonderful uh, presentation. I think we've had great uh, presentations, a clear testimony of why we need more female researchers uh, in Africa. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank, I think, the audience, uh, the global audience, the Africa audience for your participation. Uh, and uh, I think clear messages uh, uh, we need to send to our universities. Uh, one is that uh, I think we need more female leaders, uh, no question, in research. Um, we need, I think, uh, you know, these uh, female researchers uh, to be promoted to higher positions uh, to give them, uh, you know, uh, the, the necessary leadership of motivating other young female researchers uh, to come into the field of uh, research. Uh, to our governments, uh, clear messages that we need more funding, uh, more funding, particularly to go towards uh, funding female researchers. The same goes, uh, is true of our donors, uh, you know, donors who are participating. Uh, would like to see more funding going to female researchers uh, in, in Africa. Uh, and again, to the MSU leadership, uh, we would like you know, to thank you uh, for the support uh, of uh, these uh, very high caliber scholars at MSU. And we trust that uh, there'll be more uh, funding going into this uh, particular area. And also as AAP, uh, we would be very keen uh, in scaling up uh, uh, this uh, uh, program uh, because uh, there's no question uh, it is a very successful program as demonstrated by these excellent uh, presentations from uh, these uh, scholars. Uh, congratulations, congratulations to all of you uh, and uh, we, we look forward to interacting some more as you get back to your countries and uh, allow me therefore at this juncture to call upon 
Dr. Jose Jackson Malete uh, to make her closing remarks as uh, the overall coordinator of these uh, dialogues. Uh, Jose? Thank you, Richard, and thank you, scholars, for this, as Richard has said, really excellent presentations. I am not surprised. Uh, this is my expectation of all of you. Uh, I think we are fully aware of the, um, the level of experiences that you bring to the table. And we are really very happy to have had you here for the last 12 months. Uh, it's a special day for us. It's your last public activity that you'll be doing with us. Um, it was a dissemination workshop to a scholarly community. And I, I think from the vast um, diversity of disciplines that we've heard from today, that you guys represented well your institutions at home and also your, your mentors here at, at MSU. I think when we had initially conceptualized this program in thinking that we would have a face-to-face -face work dissemination workshop at the MSU campus. Um, of course, COVID came and uh, then we had to rethink how this was done. The, the, the scholars themselves, you know, designed the program uh, of how, you know, the thematic areas that they want to, to focus on, et cetera, et cetera. And I think having this virtual approach was actually better because this allowed us to engage a much broader audience. We were able to engage with our colleagues in Africa and, and to, to demonstrate you know, this whole inclusive approach to um, African research and to sharing with, um, with, the, with a broader audience your scholarly excellence. So um, you will, of course, have one final activity on Friday. Uh, we will be then working with you guys on the differences of communicating your, your research to the media and to the general public. So you have one more activity. I know you didn't need one more thing, but thanks to Richard, uh, this was added on to, to your professional development activities. And I think it would actually be, be very useful for all of you. Um, so, I mean, we, we have to be honest that 2020 was a very strange year, has been so far a strange year. You've spent the last months um, working remotely, having to deal with a pandemic. Uh, you've been a strong support for each other. And we are really happy that of the, the kind of rapport and collegial um, uh, activities that you guys have been doing to support each other. It has been difficult. You've been away from your families. And I can only imagine that that was difficult. But I admire the way you coped. and. Um, and are doing well at this time. Um, I think after today's presentations, I'm sure that you all will agree with me that Africa is in good hands. These, this group of early career women scholars have demonstrated the excellence, the knowledge, and the ability to lead in the future Africa's science systems. Um, what we look for now is for you to continue this trajectory of your career. We look for you to begin to see yourselves as the next mentors to early career researchers. So you have to begin to see yourselves as that and to be ready now for this next generation and to transform lives in Africa. And this is a hint to your home institutions that you need the support to be able to do this. And so we look forward to continuing to work with uh, your vice chancellors and others within your own departments to make sure that your, your career is successful. That's the bottom line for us, that you are successful. We will definitely be tracking your careers. You have not heard from us for the last time. You are now our ambassadors and we, ex we, we would like you to continue to share the good news about the AAP, um, African Future Scholars Program. Everything is not perfect. We were learning a lot together as, as the program unfolded, and we will take all of your suggestions um, and you know, help to modify the next set of scholars that will come through. We will be having our next cohort, uh, perhaps in 2021. It all depends on COVID. 
we are finalizing, I think, the final applicant and um, we should be starting out soon. We want to thank all of you, the eight of you, for taking the time to be with us for this past 12 months. It's been an honor to have you. We've had some great opportunities of um, socializing. This is a very important part. We danced a lot to African music and ate African food. And um, this is all part of the experience of relationship building. And uh, we hope that you continue this as you get back to your homes. So let me thank you again. And I want to say go green. And your response is? Go white. Go white. Go white. Go white. Great. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all.